<laughs> well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is so good to be here on, what is this, February 18th, the, uh, 2024, the year of our Lord, and I am sitting next to the prettiest woman on the planet, y'all. And this is my wife already saying that she was cutting off her phone and, and the first thing it does is ding. Um, but no, this is Mac and uh, Myra and we are here for another Sunday to share and prayerfully encourage um, all who choose to listen to us. Um, we have been uh, spending the month of February going through favorite scriptures from people who follow us on our uh, private Adoration Talk radio group. And today we are going to be in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, specifically verses 10 through 20. Um, you know, it probably will go into other areas of either Ephesians or other parts of the Bible between the two of us. Nevertheless, um, there is some very interesting content in those passages. Uh, Myra told me that, oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So I can't wait to hear what she is going to share. Uh, most of the time, we really don't go in depth on what we're going to talk about. And I guarantee you, uh, whatever she ends up uh, sharing about that, I know it's not going to be anything close to what I have, uh, just because um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different direction, even for me, um, because I, I, I've got some things that I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I kind of struggle with this one because um, I'm always trying to find what is the real core message going on here. That's that's how I always start out with these things. And I just wasn't getting it until I happened to be watching something else uh, this past Friday and it all made sense to me. So I'm not going to tell you what that is till it's my turn to talk. But um, nevertheless, we want to acknowledge uh, Carolyn Moore Lloyd, who is the person who recommended this to us. Carolyn, uh, we will be referring to you by name throughout this. Um, and if uh, for some reason you want to chime in, you can always uh, make a comment and we'll try to cover anything that you want pertaining to this or anything else. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Myra as we do each week. And Myra, you can lead us in in any way you choose. Bless the Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus. Thank you for another opportunity, Father, to show forth your love through the word of God. And we thank you, Father, for whoever is listening. May they be blessed and edified in their spirit. We thank you, Father. We love you. We honor you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I was so excited as I was reading this because the references really got to me more than the scripture, which is really interesting. Um, I didn't go any further than, um, I think, the 14th, uh, the 15th chapter, the 15th verse. Uh, I stopped there. But I'm sure my husband, whatever he has to say, is going to uh, encapsulate everything that's in this, this, um, these verses. But we know that um, Ephesians 6 starts off with directions about children, honoring their parents, and their mother, and, or being obedient the mother and to their mother and father, and father not provoking their, their children, and servants obeying their masters, and masters being... Uh, kind to their servants, and you know you could in today's world you can make that your boss. But, and then it goes into and ten verse ten it starts with finally. So this is 
after he's given these certain admonitions to these different groups of people, children, parents, fathers, masters, and servants, he says, finally, you know, this is, this is, to me, as I was reading it, this is including all of them. It's not sectioned off into parents or adults or children. It's finally everyone. My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I got a reference from Colossians 1, 11, about being strong in the Lord. And it said that you may walk worthy of the Lord. And this is verses um, 10 and 11 of Colossians. But the emphasis is on 11. But we don't want to just read 11. We want to, you know, kind of tell you what's leading up to it. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. So that strengthening is to be strong in the Lord. We know that the strength of our life is him. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. It's his power that strengthens us. You know, we cannot fight this fight or live this life without the power of the Lord. And we have that as Christians through the Holy Spirit. But we're being strengthened. Why do we need to be strengthened? Because there's, there's an adversary who hates us because he hates God. So if we're walking in the things of God, like it says, if we're walking worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, and being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, whoo, we are hated by the enemy. And it's demonstrated in a lot of instances in our communities, in our interactions with other people who are not believers, or say they're believers but not really, ones that are not truly walking worthy of the Lord. So we need to be strengthened because it hurts. It hurts because what we want to share is the love of Christ, knowing that there is an adversary, knowing that there is a standard, and we need to walk in that standard that Christ has given us through his word, through his actions. And that, you know, that comes to light a lot as we go forward in, in, this, in, this, um, in these passages. Because 11 says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I've read this so many times, and I, it just didn't strike me like it struck me now. But it, when it, it gave a reference to Romans 13, 14. It said, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So when we put on the whole armor of God, we're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're, we're um, I'm almost going to say something in Spanish. We're putting off those things that would, would pertain to our flesh that we don't fulfill it's lust because we know what those things are. The pride of life, the lust of our eyes, the lust of the flesh. Those <laughs> are the things, those three things we all struggle with. But it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine that. Put on the Lord Jesus. That really got me. It says, put on the whole arm of God. And the first thing came to my mind, we were in service this morning. And one of the young people were teaching. And he was teaching about David and Goliath. And there, you know, when Goliath decides, well, when David decides he's going to stand for the Lord, the first thing that Saul does is put an armor on him made of this heavy metal <laughs> to protect him. And he says, David says, no, uh-uh, this is going to hinder me. I don't need this. I've got the Lord on my side. He has brought me through so many different areas in my life with wolves and bears and these, these hostile animals trying to come after my dad's sheep. I didn't have any armor, no metal armor, but I had the Lord on my side. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. It's on us. It's on us. What? How are we going to live this life and how are we going to be able to be strengthened 
if we don't know where our strength comes from and we don't have that relationship. And then it goes on to say in um, the next verse, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That's conjunction. This is all together. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And we're looking at verses 12 and 13. And that took me to 2 Corinthians 10, 4. And it talks about, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. They were talking about wrestling against flesh and blood, but these principalities and powers, those those could be angels, and probably they are. Because remember, Lucifer was an angel. He's a fallen angel. These are spiritual. And they're good angels and they're bad angels. And they have powers against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this age. And that's... Lucifer, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. They're still in the heavenly places. He's not in hell yet. He's not in Hades. He's not below anymore yet. He's up there. There are different levels. It speaks of that. They're in the heavenly realm. But they, we don't fight against them because we don't have that power or that strength except through Christ. But mighty in God, our fight is mighty in God. He has the strength through the Spirit for pulling down those strongholds. I, I, I've met people in my life, not too many, because they, they, I have to say they're foolish. They say, "Oh, I'm gonna go against the devil. I know I got. To, I'm gonna. I'm gonna fight. I'm looking for it." I'm like, "You crazy? <laughs> you crazy? It's just like an ex when those guys with uh, the brothers of Shiva." We're looking for attention hmm. and trying to follow behind the other true Christians and seeing how things were happening and how they were casting out demons and healing people. And they, out of their lust, out of their flesh, they wanted to do the same thing. So they said, well, we'll copy them and we'll use their words. But they didn't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. So what happened? Those demons tore them up. I mean, they... They came out looking like ragamuffins with hair and, and clothes all torn up. And the enemy said to them, you know, I know Paul. I know this person. I know that for people who are truly followers of Christ. But I don't know you. Because they know, those spirits know, they can't fight against the power of Christ. Mm. They can't fight against the power of God. They can't fight against the Holy Spirit. Because that's where the power comes from. And so we need to understand the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down those strongholds. And then it goes on to say in 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. Now this is what this truth always gets to me. Because when when they talk about having girded your waist, in the olden days, men wore things like skirts. Back in those days, they wore skirts. And they, they had a piece that they could pull up when they were going to go out to work or they were going to do something strenuous so they would look, be more like pants so they could move with more liberty. So they would pull up this string and, and tuck it in and they could, they could fight better, they could work better, they could accomplish what they need to do because it was something that was going to be a struggle. So it says, gird up your waist with truth. That took me to 1 Peter 1.13. He said, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Mm. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The grace that is brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow. Because that grace is is our salvation. It also says Titus 2, 11, 12. 
For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Not to some men, all men. It's all it's up to us to whether we're gonna accept it. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. In the midst of all this danger, because it's dangerous. There it is. The grace of God. We don't have to be anxious and worried. You know, and, you know, I'm, I have to speak for myself. I've been going through some stuff, and my husband has been uh, counseling me and encouraging me. You know, our flesh gets in the way. And it's, it's not like we're out there doing all these uh, sexual things. Our flesh has a mind of its own, and it, it, it pulls us in different directions, and some of it's anxiety and worry. But when you hear the word grace, what does that make you think? That is a soothing word, grace. Grace is it, peaceful. It's full of hope. It's full of a satisfaction. It's like being out on a hot day and being given a glass of cold water and just drinking it and like, ooh, that takes away all the heat and the bother you had before. That's the grace of God is brought to you, us at the revelation of Jesus Christ because he's the messenger. He's the messenger that brings us this truth. Here we go, that truth. Because if we're fighting in the spirit by the power of his might, we're fighting for truth. And you say like, well, what does that mean? Because that truth is being the truth of the spirit. The spirit of truth is being maligned day by day by day by saying this is okay, this is okay, that's not so bad, you shouldn't do, oh, well, they're not hurting anybody. No, the truth is we still need to stand for the truth no matter what. But there's that grace. Because if we come with grace, speaking the truth of God, we're going to be bombarded. But we come without grace, we're going to get bombarded too, but rightly <laughs> so. Because we need the grace of God. But that doesn't keep us from saying the truth and standing for the truth. Because that's our responsibility, to stand for the truth. Not to say, oh, that's okay. No. Brother, sister, I'm concerned about you because there's things in your life that aren't pleasing to God. It's not like, you need to do this, you need to do that. What's your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you walking worthy of a call on your life? That's grace. Because that's, that doesn't say you're never going to change, you're never going to be anything, you're always going to mess up. No, it's opened up the door of hope. So when we gird up our loins, we're girding up our minds that we seek the Lord to be able to speak the truth with grace. That his spirit is coming out of our mouth and not ours. And he, as we know, it's, it's written in the Bible. We don't worry if we shouldn't worry about what we should speak because he will give us what we need to say in those times if we have that relationship with him. So all, I mean, I was like, this, this is seeing a lot here. I was like, this is really good. So as we go on to verse 15, oh, and this one really got me. <laughs> and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, I remember years ago, early in my in my Christian walk, I was at a, a meeting, AME, I remember, in Baltimore. Mm. And it was Bethel, the Bethel Church, and they had this afternoon meeting. And I was in a Baptist church, but we used to, we'd go over there, a bunch of people would go over there. And this little old man from, from Haiti, I think it was, called me out. Now, I'm Baptist, so I, I didn't even 
understand what that was. But he called me out, and I came down. And you know what he spoke to me? He said, God has shod your feet with the preparation of peace. And I went, oh, okay. You know, I, I, I was young in the Lord, but I had enough sense to know that God was going to reveal whatever he was saying to me. I didn't understand it, but I knew that God was going to reveal it to me. So I, I just heard what he said. And before I could leave the building, somebody, a couple people, so maybe three or four people came up to me and said, Oh, Myra, you know, that's a call to preach. And most of them were men. <laughs> and they said, You know, you're a woman. I said, You know what? God hasn't said nothing to me about being a preacher. So basically, leave me alone. Don't try to come between me and what I'm seeking God to answer, to give me an answer. And I just said, oh, okay, you know. And this scripture referred me to Isaiah 52, 7, which is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, how beautiful unto the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And who is that? That's Jesus. So you know what that did? That took me back to Romans 13, 14. Hmm. It said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We're not him, but we can put him on us. That spirit that's living within us to provoke that spirit, to be that one who proclaims peace, to bring glad tidings of good news. We don't bring, we don't proclaim salvation from ourselves. We proclaim the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we put on, when our feet are shod with the with the gospel of peace, that's Jesus Christ. It's not us. So that's not just a preacher. Those men were limiting the word of God. It's all of us in our daily lives to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. To be able to be, the, be that spokesperson that will proclaim that our God reigns. But in this Isaiah 52, 7, he's prophesying Jesus Christ is coming. Now that he has come, it says in Romans, put them on us. Put them on us. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh. And you notice they put that in there to fulfill us lust because they understood that that flesh does not want to be holy. But he says, be ye holy as I am holy. And it's, it's our battle. It's our battle to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision for the flesh. Why? Because the, to proclaim the salvation of our Lord, how can they hear if we are one minute saying one thing or acting a certain way and then saying something else? If we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, what comes out of our mouth will also be reflected in the way we walk in our daily life. It's not about taking a Bible along with you everywhere you go. It's about being there to make relationships with people, to be friendly with people, to acknowledge their, their struggle, to hear them out, and to give them counsel based on the Word of God, not based on what we think. You know, I, I was talking to someone the other day, and they were talking about being separated from their husband. And they said, I know God has set this up for this to happen. I'm like, no. There's nothing in the Bible that says God wants us to be separated or divorced. It happens. It happened to him. It happened to me. But to say that God set that up, no. That's not the truth. God desires for each of us to be together. But this world is full of the flesh and full of the lust of the flesh of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, the, the pride of life, what I want, what I need, what I, I, I. But what has God called us to? And it takes two. I'm not denying, you know, the problems in a marriage. 
but it takes two to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes that man to be the man that God has called him to, to hear from God, to understand what his position is as a husband, as a father, as the head of a household. And for that woman to acknowledge him when he is doing that. And that's a struggle. If everybody's not in the rightful place, there's no solution. I can't say we have a perfect marriage, but we, I know one thing. The prayers that we have individually and collectively have kept us together for the last seven, almost seven years. He said it's not a long time. But if we know people that are together a year, a month, six months. Because that, in reality, that's the way people, this world is just, if it's not happening and I'm not happy and I'm not happy, this is, <laughs> people are quick to fall away. But when you're, when you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to acknowledge your own fault, first of all, and then acknowledge that you need the Savior to pray for that person, not to change him. But to bless him. And I pray that he prays that for me. Amen. Amen. Not Amen. to curse him. Not even joking. <laughs> but to bless him. Mm. And say, Father, this is this is the man you have given me. And I thank you for him. And I know he loves you. And I know that's a good thing for me. Mm. Help me to see the good that you have placed by my side. That's just an example. But how beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And that is how Lord Jesus Christ put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He needs to be seen in us. He needs to be proclaimed in us. The truth of the Spirit of God needs to be proclaimed through us. And make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. And my, I'm going to conclude with this. Even though this letter was written to the Ephesians and their struggle, they, they were really struggling because they're not struggling to be righteous. They were in positions where they could actually be killed because they it was still a hostile atmosphere. And they are spoken of in Revelations. And the angel of the church of Ephesians, of Ephesus, right. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Good words to these people from Ephesus. Nevertheless, mm. Mm. I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Amen. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. That's to the church. They were doing all these good things, but they had left their first love. So I say, from Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Amen. It is um, amazing that Myra did exactly what I was hoping that she would do. Okay. And that was to cover Ephesians uh, 6, 10 through 20, uh, from the, the biblical sense and, and, and putting, 
you know, the scriptures together to make that work. Uh, a lot of times I do that. Um, but man, as I was looking at the whole passage, Hey, Janae, it's good to see you. Um, the, there's one word that popped into my head, and that's going to really be the word that I'm going to focus on. And that word is systems. And so I'm glad Myra did what she did because it now gives me the liberty to do what I believe the, the Holy Spirit wants me to do. You see, folks, as she's already so eloquently stated, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty uh, through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And what is going on in our world today is that we're fighting the wrong battle. We are fighting based upon flesh, based upon humanity, based upon evil, and we've forgotten who the real source of all of our help, as uh, what's the Psalm 121 says, all of my help coming from the Lord. And we have totally thrown that and cast that to the side because we believed in systems. And systems, even the very word of it, makes you think about something that's automated, something that has uh, been constructed, thought out by man, and we most of us, as we're going through life, we are taught, whether we realize it or not, to be a part of various types of systems, okay? And I promise you, this gets to Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, I promise you this, because after all that Myra shared, what she's talking about, Carolyn, what she's talking about, Janae, what she's talking about, Philip, what she's talking about, Sonia, is the fact that when you move away from the creator, then the only place that you can go is into something that was never part of his plan. And so what I did, and literally, I just did this maybe maybe less than a, uh, an hour ago. I, I had to go, and I started thinking about this, systems, systems, systems. And the first thing I thought about, because I am, I'm kind of into politics, and so I went to political systems, and... And I'm not talking about just United States. In fact, for the record, as I continue to share, because Myra and I, we are literally in a foreign country right now. <laughs> um, we don't think about things that just based upon the United States. We have a global perspective because we have had to deal with many political systems we're in Guatemala right now. There's a political system that's in Guatemala. And you can go anywhere in the world and there are systems. And I'm not going to be long-winded with this, but, but at the core of the political systems comes uh, empires, comes leagues, and comes uh, confederations or federations. And within those fancy names, you get all the things that you probably hear about when you look at the news, such as uh, socialism, Marxism, democracies, republics, dictatorships. They all fall into 
a system. Now, I want you to use your minds here and understand or contemplate this one thing. Are any of those, are any of those truly established by God? Okay? And I just want you to hold that thought because those aren't the only systems that I'm addressing here because that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. We also have cultural systems and these cultural systems fall into a myriad of categories, uh, economics, marital, families, educational, legal, political, religious, and also artistic. These cultural systems identify themselves in these eight components and, and more, but this is what my mind could come up with. And within those things, you know, not to, again, be super long-winded, but they're economic systems that are literally dictating how the economies of the world are going to move forward. Hey, Gina, we see you. God bless you. You know, we are in a situation now in our world where the world has reestablished what marriage is, okay? And so now marriage comes in a, a whole plethora of different ideals that match what man wants because it allows man to be able to uh, live and act and to breathe in any manner that he so fits to breathe in and live in, but there's no accountability to the one who's made us. We talk about families. The family dynamic today is all whacked out. And I mean, I'm going to even talk about even our marital situation or family situation between me and Myra. We have, man, we almost, we almost have the Brady Bunch in, in our house. We're one, we're, we're one child short of the Brady Bunch. And we're in the Brady Bunch. It came through, I think, both lost spouses. In this case, as Myra said earlier, we are both products of previous marriages. And into that, um, I've brought two biological children. Myra has brought one biological child. And then we have two adopters making this whole new created thing. Now, I mean, we make it work because at least at the foundation of that, you have a husband, wife, father, children, even though our, our, our youngest child is 26, but you, you get what I'm saying. But now the world has changed the dynamic of what family is, even is, and now you have all types of representation of what family is, not based upon what God has stated in his word, but what man has decided suits man. We go into educational, and by educational, we've now opened up the portals that all types of demonic, all types of sexual uh, 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 material is being presented before our children. We have trans and, and, and other types of people that are justifying why they have to share those types of concepts to young people. This is what we're living in. This is a system, y'all, a system. We have legal uh, uh, systems that now do not follow the statutes of the Holy Bible, but go in whatever direction suits wherever the power is going to end up or wherever the money is going to end up. You have the religious, and, and with the religious, my goodness, you have everybody doing whatever they want, and then they justify it by creating denominations and all other types of divisions that have separated us from the foundational truth of the gospel. These are systems. And lastly, artistic. 
what is uh, used to be considered to be perverted, immoral, is now classified as art. And now we have to be open for artistic expression. Our children have to be bombarded with artistic expressions that are not healthy or conducive for their growth in the Lord. And honestly, morally and also socially. So I could leave it there. More systems, racial, ethnic, and social systems. Now, I'm, I'm going to just bring two to the forefront to the forefront because I'm not talking about, we, we keep trying to have this conversation about black or white or, or whatever. L look, that is minuscule compared to the system that these things operate in. So the first one is the critical race theory. And this, I am going to read out uh, the definition because it's important to understand what it is. It says uh, that the critical race theory, or CRT, is a set of ideas holding that racial bias is inherent in many parts of Western society, especially in its legal and social institutions on the basis of their having been primarily designed for and implemented by white people. So already you see that, what do you, you have that you have divisions, you have, you have separations going on. You, 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 you know, you can go to certain uh, countries where they have what they call the caste system. And, you know, here in the U.S., even among black people, you had what we call the paper bag uh, uh, theory, which was basically if you were darker than the paper bag, you couldn't even access certain places or you were relegated to certain types of work. If you were lighter than the paper bag, it was like you're passing for, for white. These are crazy, idiotic concepts. And it, like I said, it goes beyond just the United States, it happens all over the world. And, and so that's part one of it. But then the other one is diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's been uh, sold to us as a system. You can't even be in the workplace. And I know this is a fact because I've been retired since 2019. And I remember the, the hint of DEI even coming in at that point where we had to take certain and special training in order to deal with certain types of people, all for uh, the uh, purpose of being able to fairly communicate and socialize and collaborate with each other. And I saw it coming in, and these things were becoming mandatory, no matter what your faith or religious beliefs were, you would have to follow the mandate. And I can tell you, if there's anybody out there right now that works in human resources, what, no matter what they personally believe, they have to follow this DEI agenda. And this is what it is. It is an organizational framework which seek to promote the fair treatment and full participation of all people, particularly groups who have historically been underrepresented or subject to discrimination on the basis of identity or disability. Now, on the surface, that sounds, oh, that's really good. That's fair. Well, you know what? Back in the day, People thought communists where everything would be shared equally. They also thought that that was also, that's a good thing. But you know what's really funny is that no matter whether we're talking about socialism or communism or DEI, it seems like the people at the top never seem to have to follow the rules that are in place for everyone else. And I'm going to tell you what the dangers are uh, in DEI, CRT, and any other established uh, cultural or social or uh, ethnic uh, system 
that there are hidden dangers that end up separating us, end up identifying us based upon someone's complexion or someone's sexuality. I haven't even gotten there yet, but don't you think it's really weird how somebody has to tell you that they're trans? But yet, I don't feel like I have to tell somebody, hey, I'm heterosexual. How are you today? You, you, you understand what I'm saying? These things are systems that, that have made us crazy if we really stop and stop thinking about, you know, who we might be offending or what people might think about us. But are we really, really, really in bondage to these type of things? I'm not done yet. Now I'll go right into it. Sexual orientation. And I, I, I'm going to elaborate on this because, man, I thought I knew them all. But then I popped in and, and, and looked up something uh, today and man, it's like nine of these things. You know, like there are nine components of the, the, the fruit of the spirit. Well, it seems to be nine components of this wickedness in as far as sexuality is concerned, because everybody has these crazy identifications. And I'm not going to go into the definitions. Y'all look them up. But l listen to what man has done. Man has this thing categorized as... Uh, I'm asexual, okay, or uh, I'm autosexual. Y'all look these things up. Bisexual, demisexual, gray asexual, monosexual, okay, pansexual, queer, and questioning. Now, look. If I had to do a pop quiz on this, I wouldn't know what in the world to do. I would flunk the test. Look, I put all this out there because when we are talking about these systems and what Myra so beautifully and wonderfully shared uh, in, in what she prepared for you guys today. Hey, Ramon, I see you. All of these systems a man created, all of these systems have a purpose based upon what man thinks is right for man. And in this case, I'm including mankind. So that's man and woman. These systems are put in place to create this uh, totalitarian. What's the word? Uh, totalitarian. I think that's the word. Oh, don't even. You don't do that. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, this 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 society where everything is peace and love. We all share amongst each other. Everything is all this, and and if somebody is doing something immoral, it's okay. And if somebody is doing something crazy, it's okay. In other words, tolerance. Is the big word in this society because, um, oh yeah, what's that? All that's a uh, Ramon alter existence. Yeah, bro. Um, yeah. So this is this is <laughs> what's going on today, and people that call themselves being intelligent are telling us to buy into the okie doke, and I have no other way but to say this. And the reason why I went in this direction after really struggling with this, and I'm glad Myra did what she did because I, I would have probably done something close, but I knew that, that, that there was another part of this that we needed to address because at the core of a system, do you understand systems eliminate freedom? Man, I, it hit me, Myra. Look, I gotta, look, I got to hold her hand now. Look, it hit me like a ton of bricks because we were listening to something on Friday where a gentleman, I'm going to call out names, but the gentleman said, you know, uh, people have put all their confidence in a particular political system 
or a particular economic system or a particular social system. And what we've done is we've literally said that we don't believe God has actually given us the freedom that we don't have to be in a system at all. And what I'm saying is this, we do not have to comply to those things that are meant to destroy us because anything that is conceived of man and man alone without the Holy Spirit's uh, interaction in it is set up for your destruction and for your doom. And we have to be real about this. When we talk about the, the weapons of our welfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Myra said it. There are demonic forces out there that are influencing, influencing us. I, they cannot tell you what to do. But what they can do is they can set it up so that you will just fall in just like mice going through a maze, and you just do whatever they set you up to do, and the next thing you know, you've got mothers against uh, daughters and uh, sons against fathers, and everybody is angry, and everybody is hostile and upset, and they are frustrated because they know that there's something better, but they don't know how to get it because they have forgotten the first love, which is Jesus. This is the one that we're supposed to look to. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth. Do you not understand this? We keep letting people tell us who we are. And I'm going to really be bold now. Even in our, what we call churches, I'd rather say assemblies, but in the houses of worship, we, we allow people to tell us where we have our anointing. We allow people to tell us how we should live. And I'm not talking about from a, 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 a moral, spiritual perspective. I'm talking about how you should be conducting oneself at, with these rules and regulations that I cannot find to this day in the scriptures. What in the world is an ordination by man? When God has said, if he's called you, he says, I'm the one who has ordained you. I, I knew who you were from the very beginning. I ordained you and I purposed you. We, we go through these hoops and all of these bells and whistles because of systems, guys. And they are in our churches and they are in our societies and they are in our communities. And we keep falling for the okie doke. Right now, you see that there, uh, there are particular uh, preachers, pastors that are in trouble because their immorality has finally been exposed to the point where everybody can see it. And we feel like somehow they have let us down. But the devil is a liar because, no, we let ourselves down because we chose to follow man instead of following God. God does not let you down. Look what does uh, Ramon say right here. Look, as he said it's also is based on a society that has quit on itself. Uh, pulling down strongholds create a standard that they do not want. Amen, bro. Look, look, I'm, 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 I'm wrapping up because I told y'all I'm trying to put in a new thing to not go over an hour. But this is the gist of it. You know, Myra gave you all the clothing, you know, the, the, the belt of truth. She gave you the uh, helmet of salvation, the shield of faith the breastplate of righteousness. You know, she's given you these things, all right? And we don't want to forget the, the, real, the real one, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And all of these things is what God has equipped us in order to do the real battle. We are not fighting against each other. It might look like it, they might tell you that's what it is. They might tell you there's a war going on and there are actual wars going on. And I will tell you this, even those wars are spiritually manipulated because 
All Satan has to do is create an atmosphere on the things that Myra talked about. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. On the foundation of those three things creates a, a situation of evil. And once man has fallen into that trap of evil, they might look innocent, they might talk like they got it going on, but I tell you, if they have associated themselves with any of these systems, then they are not in order with God. God has given us the commands of life. He gave it to them in the old covenant, knowing that they couldn't live by them because they're God's standards, not ours, and understanding that man could never live by those. He gave it to us very simply. Love him, love each other. And when you do those things in real love, real love does not make you a punk. Real love lets you be able to love people that hate you or despise you, and you do not have to give in and be suckered by them, but you can, instead of fighting uh, force with force, physical force, that is, you fight it with the force of love, spiritually, to eradicate that demonic system. Because all of these things, I put them into categories, but ultimately, the real system is Satan. And that's his system. And his system has always been set up for us to want to desire all the lusts that we have within us. Some of us have lust for money. Some of us have lust for power. Some of us have lust for sex. Either way, we end up falling into those categories if we do not have the whole armor of God that we can withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. Carolyn, as we wrap this up, I hope, I pray that we hit this the way that we were supposed to hit this. I, I, I believe we've done it by God's standards. I hope you got something out of it. And anybody else who is still with us right now, I see you, Janae. She's been rooting us on uh, for the whole time that she's been with us. And anyone else, look, look, let's not play games here. Um, we, we are living in a state of decay. It is not going to be any better. It's only going to get worse. I don't care what they say. People talked about this harmonious society. That's not going to happen, y'all. Trust me, it's not going to happen. But we can be strong. We can be connected. We can be secure collectively as an assembly, as the true church, not by brick and mortar, not by cement, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. We can be united, and when the hardest of times come, we can stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and know that no system can ever, ever separate us from the love of God in Jesus. Well. Go ahead. I was wondering why I didn't finish everything, but this is what you are just saying, and this is what you are demonstrating, that praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Because that's what we're doing. We're being watchful and reporting, and it says, and for me, and I'm going to put this on you, Oh, oh. That utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Because I don't, I stopped at a certain place and I could not go any further. And what I didn't say, you spoke it. You talked about the shield of faith, and I didn't, and the fiery dots. I didn't talk about that in the helmet of salvation. 
Everything was covered the way it was supposed to. And that's how we need to live because when we were reading this, and I say we, he's different from me and I'm different from him, but God had a way to use both of us to go through this whole uh, series of chap of verses his way that God wanted him to express it and my way the way God wanted it to be expressed. That's living in the spirit because I've read this, he's read it, but when you sit down and say, God, what, what do you want me to share? He will reveal it to because we're being watchful. We're being watchful of the word for the people of God to hear the word. And even as he, he was speaking about the pastors, dropped in my heart, how many pastors have committed suicide? Because they're trying to live up to a standard that's not in the Bible. They're trying to be everything to all people when their responsibility is just to speak the word. But the standard of this world has said you got to be there for everybody. You got to do this. You got to. This is over and above the word. And it wears them out. It pulls on them. It breaks up their families. A pastor is supposed to show forth the word of God. That's all he's supposed to do. He's not to tell you what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to go. That's not his job. But you're killing God's men by pulling on him that he has all the answers. His job is to let you know what the word of God is for you to seek it out and search it and get the answer from God. So those who are living in sin and corrupting the word of God by their actions, that's one type of passage. But there's others who really love the Lord and want to be representative of the word of God, but have been influenced by the system that has told them that they have to do all this other stuff too. And that's not what God is calling them to do. So the whole system is being corrupted by the enemy because people who are really called to be pastors are being destroyed, killing themselves. Imagine that committing suicide because they feel they're not living up to a standard and they can't deal with it anymore. So what is that telling us about what we are doing to God? And the assembly, as my husband calls it, as the gathering, as I call it, as the church, as we call it, it's not one man in the flesh. It's only one man that was in the flesh and was holy and above all others, that's Jesus Christ. That's all that man can do is represent him. He is not your counselor. He is not your father. He is not the one to tell you what to do. He is the one to show forth the word of God, be a good husband to his wife and to his children. And when they're pulled on every edge that breaks up the family, that breaks up the children, that's not what they were called to. But they've been deceived by what the man says a pastor should be, trying to fulfill all the fleshly desires of the congregation, the people, when all he wants to do is satisfy the heart of God through the word of God. So pray and realize how we as the people of God are participating in an ungodly system that we have changed and created and still changing and creating it in the image of man, not in the image of God. God bless you guys. God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus.